white and wide, blood of Christ the crucified. From your hands, your feet, your side, Jesus, I trust in you. Saints, I'm kind of excited. I'm, I've been thinking about the revival that's coming and giving some thought to it. Going back and studying some older revivals, and I mean real revivals. And um, it's just exciting. Uh, I know that you've been praying for a lot of people, lost loved ones, people that are caught up in religion and so on and so forth. And this just might encourage you today. Uh, a little over a week ago, I asked the Lord to give me a word to share with the brethren over here. And he gave me John 15. And I'd like to share a part of it with you. John 15 and 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, notice it's the branches in him. This is not people that we would normally consider lost people. Um, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. Fruit, of course, is the fruit of Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Spirit. Okay. He taketh it away. Notice who is the one that removes it. It's the Father that removes it. And every branch that beareth fruit, he cleanseth it, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word which I have spoken unto you. I would that everybody today had received the same word. Right? Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, so neither can ye except ye abide in me. Well, we know that um, if that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, then you abide in the Son. So you, you, you learn how to abide in Christ by His Word, His true Word, right? And He's telling them to abide in Him But really what he's saying is bear fruit, because if you don't bear fruit, there's nothing you can do to abide in him. The Father is the one that breaks you off, right? So neither can ye except ye abide in me. And of course we know abiding in him, having that in you, that word in you which was given from the beginning, uh, is, is how we abide in him to the uttermost, right? And um, and doing that is the way to bear fruit, and bearing fruit is the way to not be broken off. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Well, this is really totally destroys unconditional eternal security, doesn't it? Along with just about everything else in the book. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you. That is, God's word abiding in us is the manifestation of Christ in us, And the reason he can trust us with a promise like this is because Christ in you can do the work, right? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and even so shall you be my disciples. Even as the Father hath loved me, I also have loved you. Abide ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the thing about being broken off, uh, Brother Charlie asked me after I shared this chapter, actually, um, can somebody be grafted back in? Well, I'd like to talk to you about the revival, but I want to do a few things before I get there. Uh, Romans 11, let's start in verse 7. What then? That which Israel seeketh for, that he obtained not. But the election obtained it, and the rest were hardened. The election, the chosen. And who was that? When Jesus, of course, came on the scene, and he preached the gospel, um, Israel 
stuck with the law by and large. Uh, but his disciples came unto grace through faith. And they were the chosen from among the Jews of those days. The disciples who came out from among them. He called them the ecclesia, the called out ones. That was his ecclesia in those days. They were the elect, the ones who bore the fruit of Jesus Christ. But the rest were hardened. According as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, even until this very day. So, I mean, all the way down to now, there's a a hardening in the heart of the Jews, okay? No, there's always been a remnant. There's a remnant coming out still, you know, but by and large, they have been hardened. And David said, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow thou down their back always. And he goes on to talk about the the Jews being broken off, the Gentiles being grafted in, so on and so forth. And, and of course he's speaking to the Romans, you know, which are Gentiles by and large. And verse 19 says, Thou wilt say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, by their unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by thy faith. So long as you stand in faith, uh, whether you are a Jew or whether you are a Gentile, you may abide in this vine. And uh, you may abide in this olive tree, right? Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, neither will he spare thee. So, I mean, he broke them off from unbelief, and they fit the tree even better than we do. The natural tree. He spared not the natural branches, neither will he spare thee. Behold then the goodness and the severity of God towards them that fell severity, but towards thee God's goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, that's not unconditional, is it? Otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Oh my gosh, how many people have been cut off because of their false doctrines? They never thought they really needed to keep his commandments. Right? They never thought they had to walk by faith for everything. All of the righteousness of God and all of the fruit of God and all of the works of God and so on and so on. They never thought that. It was kind of like, okay, I accepted Jesus. Now I get to sit down and take it easy till the rapture. Well, they were told something that wouldn't offend them and so they could keep on paying their tithes and so on and so forth. Thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they continue not in their unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Okay, so this seems to be an answer, but, but really not quite. Okay, Notice that the people that were cut off when God... Um, broke off Israel and grafted in the church. Those people, they were Jews, but they're not the same ones who are being grafted back in in our day. What you might say is we're talking about races here. We're not talking about individuals. Uh, Sure, they were broken off, um, and today a remnant of them is going to be grafted back in. Um, though Israel be as the sands of the sea, it is the remnant that shall be saved. Okay, And there's a remnant of natural Jews who will be grafted back in and are actually being grafted back in, but by a large extent, this won't start on a big scale until later in the tribulation period, like about two years into the tribulation period. And they also, if they continue not in their unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou was cut out of that which is by nature a wild olive tree, and was grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which are the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? I would not have you, I would not, excuse me, for I would not, brethren, have you ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that a hardening in part hath befallen Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What does that mean? It means after the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, he's going to remove the 
hardening of the heart for a remnant to come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. You see, David, there it is, all Israel, not a remnant. No, all Israel here is Israel and the Gentiles. It's everybody that's grafted into the olive tree. Uh, We're not Jews according to nature, but we're Jews according to the Spirit. Our circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh. It's not the natural children of Abraham that are counted for a seed, right? We know that. The Word says that. So, when he says all Israel, he's talking about everybody, Jew and Gentile, who is grafted in and stays in the olive tree to bear fruit, right? Amen. Um, As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. And we know that this is the man-child, the uh, man-child in whom Jesus lives. We pray that Jesus lives in all of us, and he does to one extent or another, but this is going to be the first fruits of those who come into the image of Jesus in the tribulation period, at the beginning of the tribulation period. He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Oh, praise be to God. And this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As touching the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So he can bring them back in again. Again, the ones that are coming to be grafted in now were never broken off. It was Jews that were broken off. And and in the text he's talking about the Jews as a whole being broken off, and the Gentile Jews, if you will, Uh, being grafted back in. So, let's take a moment to look at um, Luke 13. And I'm going to read 23. And one said unto him, Lord, are they few that are saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in by the narrow door. For many, I say unto you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. In other words, there's going to come a time when or people are trying to enter in now and are not able, but there's going to come a time that they, it won't be possible. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut to the door. Well, it's not possible for somebody to enter in if they haven't already entered in, when they die. Unless God does a miracle and returns them and, you know, goes through that route, but that's very unusual, right? Okay, also, if a person is reprobated, the door is closed. If they die, the door is closed. If you're in the Gentiles when he's turning to the Jews, the door is closed. There are many times when doors close here. Uh, We're coming to the time when the door is going to be closed to be in the bride. We've discovered that. The Lord's spoken it to us many places in the Scriptures and many dreams and visions. So there are doors closing. But once the Master closes the door, you can say anything you want to. You're not coming in. That's what he's saying. And you begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We did eat and drink in thy presence. And thou didst teach in our streets. And, you know, Matthew 7, you know, they did many mighty works, you know, but it didn't make any difference, right? Prophesied, whatever. And he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. So, there will come a time when the door is closed and it's not possible to graft anybody in, you know, if the door is closed to them. Okay, so now I want to go um, to Ezekiel, chapter 18, and verse 21. But if the wicked turn from all of his sins that he hath committed, and keep all of my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his transgressions that he hath committed shall be remembered against him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
says the Lord, and not rather that he should return from his way and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doth, shall he live? In other words, if he dies at that moment, of course not. None of his righteous deeds that he hath done shall be remembered. In his transgression that he hath transgressed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Okay, so when a person turns away from righteousness, uh, they die. They spiritually die. And when they physically die, there is absolutely no way back, right? So we all agree on that, right? So what we're looking for is Charlie's answer. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. And I want to just remind you of a few things there. I know you probably remember it pretty good. I'm just going to remind you of a few things to because of where we're headed with this, okay? You remember in, a, in Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came unto Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Okay, so we we found out all true Israel, all not what is recognized as Israel out there, but all true Israel is those who are uh, are in the olive tree, grafted into the olive tree. And Israel represents the church because in that olive tree now, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're in the church. You understand there is no two covenants; there's only one. You must be born again. And um, people call the Jews the chosen, but that's not true. They've been broken off. The ones that are chosen are the ones who have received their Messiah and are walking in his steps. Those are the ones that are chosen. Let's get it right here. Uh, So this prophecy is mostly against the shepherds of Israel. And his complaint is that... They did not feed the sheep. They fed themselves. Of course, we can see that. You know, they live pretty high off the hog usually compared to their average follower. And they scattered the sheep, and they didn't go look for the sheep. I know in the past we've talked about how this is the nature of faction. It's the nature. They don't, they're not interested in really raising up the sheep, feeding the sheep. It's, they don't have the gift to feed the sheep. All they've got is a gift to scatter them. And, but, but faction is something that's been around for a long time, too. Denominationalism is faction. Sectarianism is faction. There's, there are divisions in the church. The church has been scattered by a bunch of shepherds that were not like the original shepherds, the one that followed, ones that followed Jesus and the ones that Jesus said um, to um, Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one. Well, in the church, God desired that his people be one, one flock and one shepherd. In Jesus' day, that was true. That happened. Uh, there was one flock, one shepherd. All of the sheep that came out of Judaism were under Jesus in his day, right? He was the son of David. All of the sheep that came out of the many fractured pieces of Judaism and all of its denominations came under Jesus. Wow, that was really a unity, wasn't it? And it was because he was teaching them the truth from heaven. And they were um, drawing doctrinally closer and closer together, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Lord has a bone to pick with the shepherds of Israel, the apostate leadership, who have basically made themselves leaders of Israel, but not by going through the door. Obviously, Jesus in John chapter 10 talked about going into the sheepfold of Israel, calling his own sheep by name, and leading them out. That's when he called them the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. 
The rest of them weren't the called out ones. Now, that religion is the same today. There is Christianity that we call loosely Christianity. Now, Jesus is going into Christianity, and he's calling his sheep by name, and he's calling them out. And these today are the ecclesia, the church. The church is not this larger body. The church is that smaller body that's coming out from among them. Okay? So, the Lord's complaint is with the shepherds. They're not feeding them. They're skinny sheep. They're hungry. You know, there's fat sheep that have been feeding off the fat, and they're full of flesh. But they're skinny sheep, and they're hungry. And the Lord's complaining about it. He said, he's going to be the shepherd of his sheep, etc., etc. You know all this, right? And the Lord said he was going to judge between sheep and sheep. That just means he's talking about the fat ones and the skinny ones, right? The rams and the he goats that are among them too, right? The Lord is going to divide his sheep because he's only going to call his own by name, you see. And he's going to lead them out. So if you come on down to, say, verse... um, uh, 20. Therefore thus saith the Lord unto them, Behold, I, even I, I, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. These are the truly hungry sheep that aren't getting enough to eat, right? You know, when people uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness, uh, the Lord decides to do something, doesn't he? And a lot of times this happens to people in regular old churches out there, and they're just not getting any food, you know? And so the Lord said, he's going to do something about this. He said, because you thrust with the side and with the shoulder and push all the the diseased with your horns till you have scattered them ab- abroad. These are the fat sheep, and I'm, pro- I'm guessing the he goats and the rams too, right? Um, till you have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock. Wow, he's going to save his flock, the flock that are under the shepherds of Israel. He's going to save his true church, saints. I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey. A prey to who? Well, a prey to the shepherds, for one thing, and every beast of the field out there that wants to prey on them because they haven't been uh, fattened up in the word of God and getting wisdom and so on and so forth, you know. And I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up one shepherd over them. There it is, the one flock, one shepherd that Jesus promised to us. And he shall feed them, even my servant David. This is the David ministry. Can you imagine that just as the way it was in Jesus' day, so it's going to be in our day. He was the son of David in his day. You know, there was people like Joseph and David and Jesus and the man-child. These are all the same pattern here, right? The main difference is is that Jesus lives in everyone else. Jesus came in a body of the son of David. Um, He was the son of man indwelt by the son of God. And David was a man after God's own heart. That was the type there, right? And the man-child in the end time, same thing. Son of man, son of David, dwelt in by the Son of God. And of course, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is all of our hope, right? But the Lord is raising up a leadership to bring us into the image of Jesus Christ. And and first of all, we have to have the restoration of the true doctrines. We've been heading in this direction for a long time with the Reformers and so on and so forth. We just haven't quite made it yet. (laughs) We're we're going in the right direction, okay? So they're going to be one flock and one shepherd. Can you imagine that when this revival comes, the people are going to come out from among the apostate sects of Judaism, or Christianity, excuse me, and they're going to be under the Davids. And he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Well, the Lord says he's going to do this. And again, you know, According to Matthew 21, 
Let's see, I'm going to read um, 33 on down. Here another parable. There was a man that was a householder who planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into another country. And when the season of the fruits drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen to receive his fruits. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Well, you know, the leaders of the so-called churches will do this whenever God sends somebody there to, to bring forth the fruit, right? Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them in the same manner. But afterwards he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But the husbandmen, when they saw the son, said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. Hey, this has happened in quite a few generations. Did it not happen with Joseph? Did it not happen with David? Did it not happen with Jesus? And is it not happening with the man-child, the David man-child in our day? So these people have um, an unrighteous, illegal hold. They came up another way, uh, as Jesus said. They came up another way. They did not go through the door to be promoted over the sheep. Right. And they took him and cast him forth out of the vineyard and killed him. So they are doing today. Not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. When therefore the Lord of the vineyard shall come, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those miserable men, and will let out the vineyard unto other husbandmen, who shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said unto him, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same was made the head of the corner. This was from the Lord, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you, and shall be given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That he has done and is doing. And he that falleth on this stone shall be broken to pieces. That is, those that repent will find mercy and grace. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will scatter him as dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. Oh, no, not really, huh? I wonder if the Pharisees of our day know he's speaking of them, too. And when they sought to lay hold on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Well, why was he the stone which the builders rejected? Did you know that David was a prophet? The Bible says so. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, we're told, Concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did point unto when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and of the glories that should follow them. How did they demonstrate the sufferings of Christ? They were a stone that the builders rejected. Jesus in them. It, look, it says, the Spirit of Christ which was in them. Jesus in them was a type of a stone which the builders rejected. And, of course, they were God's sent leadership, right? Praise God. And But that happened with David. You know, he was the, he was the stone which the builders rejected. His own son rebelled, for instance, in one case and led Israel against him in an Absalom rebellion, right? So, you know, uh, of course, the same thing happened with Jesus. And um, let's go back to Ezekiel 34. Same thing happened with Jesus. Same thing happened with David, Joseph, you know, the man-child. All these patterns always repeat. They always do. And um, so back where we were in, in Ezekiel 34, where the Lord decided to fulfill one flock and one shepherd. Now, this is coming. It's coming down the road. Multitudes of people. I know you've got lost loved ones. 
that they're lost while they're in church. They don't walk in the Spirit. They don't walk after the Spirit. They don't walk in the steps of Jesus Christ. They're just dead in their sins while they're claiming religion. You know, and there's a lot of them like that. There's a lot of people that are falling away because they didn't get the tools. They didn't get the Word in their heart from the preachers that were not feeding them to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And they're out there in the world because they got disgusted and gave up because they failed. Well, they just didn't have the armor to protect them. And their leaders didn't have it on either. So, um, here we are. But this is God's promise, that there will be one flock, one shepherd. And verse 25 says, And I will make with them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. And he is. He's cleansing his land. There will be nothing there but his people in his holy promised land. And they shall dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in its season. And, of course, this is the kingdom, a repetition of the physical kingdom of David on a spiritual realm. It's a parable, right? And there shall be showers of blessings, and the tree of the field shall yield its fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase. And they shall be uh, secure in their land. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them out of the hand of those that made bondmen of them. Oh, praise God. Those shepherds just made bondmen out of them. They wouldn't. They stood in the door, as Jesus said. They wouldn't enter in, and they wouldn't let any other sheep enter in either. And God wants to pour out the Holy Spirit. Look how many of them are, are resisting it. But that's not going to last. That's all going to fail. Just stick with me. You'll see what I'm talking about. And they shall no more be a prey to the nations, neither shall the beasts of the earth devour them. Yeah, the beasts of the earth of the, you know, the nations, the kingdoms, so on and so forth, you know, have they, they've become nationalistic and fallen in with the world rather than with the kingdom of God because they don't know the difference, right? And they are prey. But they shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. They won't be afraid. Well, what about when they go to cut their heads off? I mean, <laughs> you know what? The the power of a, of holiness will keep them from being afraid. They will, for a perfect level, cast out fear. First of all, saints, if that's the worst you get, you, that's that's not bad because, first of all, you wouldn't feel a thing, you know, and you'd be in the presence of Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, glory be to God. There is nothing for us to fear, and uh, except God. If we fear God, we'll have everything else. And um, they shall no more be a prey to the nations, neither shall the beasts of the earth devour them. But they shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up unto them a plantation for renown, and they shall be no more consumed with famine in the land. No more skinny sheep. <laughs> neither bear the shame of the nations any more. And, and and really, Christianity has borne the shame of the nations. They've shown up the hypocrisy. They see right through uh, what a lot of the sheep don't see right through in the preachers, you know. And they shall know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord. And ye, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, says the Lord. And then, of course, he goes into the Lord deals with the house of Esau, the Edomites. And it is because, of course, they took every chance they could to persecute their brother Jacob. And, uh, you know, as Paul said in Hebrews, um, he's, Esau sold his birthright because of a root of bitterness against his brother Jacob. His hatred for Jacob cost him his, his life. His spiritual life. So, let's let's go on down through 36. I want to get to this revival here, you know. 
what the Lord is going to do in a wonderful, wonderful way. Verse 8 says, And ye, O mountain of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are at hand to come. That means they're coming out of bondage and they're coming to their promised land under their David. Okay? And the Davids, of course, are a first fruits company that are going to do the work that Jesus did 2,000 years ago with his sheep. And, of course, it's Jesus in them that does this. They can't claim anything. They're not proud. They're not arrogant. They know that they are just a vessel. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and you shall be tilled and sown. The Lord is promising a great revival. What I thought the Lord was promising a tribulation. Well, that's exactly what he's doing. They're both of them going to happen together. And in fact, that's the highest motivating factor out there is what's going on out there in the tribulation to cause people to run under the blood of Jesus, right? And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel. There it is again, all Israel. All the house of Israel. All the house of Israel was under David, we noticed. All of them under David. One shepherd over them. Amen. So, and it was all the house of Israel that was grafted into the olive tree that were actually the ones that were God's people and followed him. He said, all the house of Israel, even all of it. I will multiply men upon you. They're all of Israel is going back to the promised land. Live on the promises of God, right? And the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste places shall be built, and I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited after your former estate. He's talking about the land now. And will do better unto you than at your beginnings. Amen. The, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house, right? And you shall know that I am the Lord. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of children. Oh, glory be to God. Let's see, I'm going to jump over to verse 24. For I will... Take you from among the nations, which is, of course, where God's people are. They're in the world. They're among the nations. They're captive to their nation. They even pledge allegiance to their nation or whatever, you know. I'll take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you. This is the job of the David ministry, by the way. Clean water upon you, the Word of God, right? Washing of the water with the Word which is what he says he's going to do with his bride in Ephesians, right? And you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Wow, what a promise. God's people are so captive to the idols of this world. And a new heart will I give unto you and a new spirit will I put within you. And that's the born again experience right there. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. In other words, God's hard-hearted people are going to be soft-hearted, right? And I will put my spirit within you. Now, that hadn't happened to most of God's people, but this certainly would bring a lot of life to them. The overwhelming majority of God's people have never received the former rain. They have received a new spirit, which is your born-again spirit, but they, which is Christ's Spirit manifested in you, right? But they've never received the Holy Spirit. And I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep mine ordinances. The Lord will cause you to walk in his statutes, and you will keep his ordinances. Something many have thought they could not ever do. Okay? And do them. Because God does this for those who walk by faith in him. Right? And, you, and a lot of the church is not walking by faith in him in any kind of way whatsoever. And you shall dwell in the land, and I will give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all of your uncleannesses, and I will call for the grain and multiply it and lay no famine upon you. 
I will multiply the fruit of the tree, increase the field. Now, now I know people are saying, well, this is just natural Israel. Well, you just watch and see if natural Israel enters into any of this. No, there will be an ecclesia brought out of natural Israel that will enter into this. Watch the trouble in their land. Watch what happens. He's not talking about that whatsoever. And you will bear no more the reproach of famine among the nations. You will receive no more. Then shall you remember your evil ways and your doings that were not good, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. In other words, they will truly have a, a, a reason to repent. Right? They will be grieved for these things. Now, chapter 37 is, in the end time, the greatest revival has ever happened on planet Earth. The greatest. It is the fulfillment of what we've been talking about from Ezekiel 34 all the way up to here to Ezekiel 37. This great revival, this great promise, this great restoration to the land, all these things. That's what Ezekiel 37 is talking about. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of dry, full of bones. And he caused me to pass through by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? In other words, they're dead. You know, God's got a lot of dead people. I mean, honestly. They are dead. They are not alive by the Spirit of God. They do not hear the voice of their master. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. They are out there following religions. You know, they went astray as soon as they were born, speaking lies with their religions, just as the Bible says, you know. They're dead, dead in sin. They have no faith to be delivered of their sin. Their preachers don't believe in being delivered of sin. They are dead in sin. And not only that, there's people that are even worse than that. They've backslidden from those dead religions, and they're out there dead in the world. There's a lot of dead people out there that claim to be Christians. He said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy over these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, which is the word spirit, by the way, same word, to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, uh, and breath here also can be spirit. Um, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Oh, glory to God. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Now, notice who this is. This is Ezekiel, who was caught up to the throne of God and sent to the people of the captivity. He represented the man-child. Uh, and he was called the son of man. Very interesting, all the way through the book of Ezekiel. And now, he's telling him to prophesy, to speak the word of the Lord to these dry bones, to bring resurrection life into them. Oh, glory be to God. Are you getting my drift here? Okay. Okay. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, an earthquake, and the bones came together. An earthquake. Isn't that interesting? You know, when the factions started back in, I think it was May the 14th of uh, 2011, we had uh, a revelation that there was going to be an earthquake. We weren't sure whether it was going to be a physical one or a spiritual one. Well, some people actually got a word that it was going to be a spiritual one. So, And it, sure enough, it was because uh, some people in the midst started a faction right there. And there was an earthquake. It was a separation of the earth. 
Well, there is coming an, another earthquake, not a separating of people going forth into the world and falling into sin and corruption and all these things. Uh, that was an earthquake away from righteousness. This is an earthquake to righteousness. It's coming back the other way, and it's much bigger. Okay, am I saying that it won't be physical earthquake? No, there's going to be some physical earthquakes, folks. Some bad ones, worst ones this world's ever seen. Uh, and behold, an earthquake. So, this thing starts with the, an earthquake because it is a shift. Uh, it's going to be a shift of people that have been factioned by denominationalism and by preachers and all so on and so forth away from God's true leadership back to God's true leadership. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I beheld, and lo, there were sinews upon them, and flesh came up, and skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, and they shall live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. In other words, not just the called, these are the called and elect. Not the called that don't get elect or chosen, but the called and elect. And they are the, the whole house, Romans 11 and 26, all Israel, the ones that are grafted in. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are clean cut off. What does that mean? Dead in sins. God is about to do something that's above and beyond anything he needed to do, really. It's, it's his grace. It's grace. He's going to restore a lot of backslidden so-called Christians out there that have slidden away from the Lord and had no hope of ever coming back. He's about to restore people who came into the kingdom, received a new spirit, but got trapped by denominationalism and or some religion of some sort and didn't grow up and stayed in their sins. He's about to restore those people. And guess what? Where are they all going? <laughs> Well, I can tell you one thing. Um, the Bible's pretty plain that God is going to give His church a lot of visions. Psalm 89, 19 and 20 talks about that. Visions of David. They're going to get revelations of who their David is. The Lord said He was going to do that. I'll, I'll talk about that later if I get time. Uh, we're clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit in you. There's the, hmm, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which 99% of them need. And you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord, has spoken it, and performed it, says the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, And thou, son of man, take thee one stick. Okay, now he's talking about joining the two sticks, the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Judah, and the Israelites that had joined to either one. Why do I say that? Because when when Ephraim went in the northern ten tribes, they made the golden calf and made false priests. Uh, the Israelites who uh, wanted to seek their God left and went to Judah. So there were a lot of Israelites that joined with Judah because that's where the presence of God was. They had no presence of God over there. They had the two golden calves and a bunch of false preachers, and they knew it. So, so what's the difference, though? Well, he's going to put his spirit in them. See, the northern ten tribes were represented by the people that were not spirit-filled. Judah, which means praise, were the people that were spirit-filled. But now, they're both going to be spirit-filled. 
He's joining them together by the Spirit. This whole valley of dry bones, all Israel is going to be joined together by an outpouring of His Spirit. But first the former rain, and then the latter rain. They're going to come into unity. Okay, so I'm going to skip on down. Verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land, that is the northern ten tribes, that's the non-spirit-filled groups, which are now to be spirit-filled, which is one thing that makes them one with their brethren, right? And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And we know that that is Jesus in his man-child company. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Well, has that happened yet? No, it hasn't. But it's about to. It's going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to be an overnight snap your fingers type thing, you know, obviously. But he's going to do it. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols. Well, their, their religions and their preachers, that's their biggest idols. And self, that's their third biggest idol, right? With their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places. Notice that their dwelling places, which were not in their promised land, represent their sins. I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So now you know what it means to go back to your promised land and to live on the promises, right? The land of promise. So shall they be my people. And I will be their God. And my servant David shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. There they are. One shepherd and one flock. All of them spirit filled. And they're all under Jesus. He said, I'm going to be the shepherd of my sheep in Ezekiel 34. They shall also walk in mine ordinances and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers dwelt. Yes, our spiritual forefathers did dwell there. They said, you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, Paul said, right? They shall dwell therein, they and their children, and their children's children, for forever, forever. And David my servant shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them, and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them. Oh, isn't that awesome? Saints, what, what kind of a revival is this? Well, it's, if you've ever studied any of the revivals of the past, some of them were so supernatural. Uh, so powerful, just multitudes of people just coming into the kingdom with nobody even preaching to them, just the Lord um, doing it. I was told you I'd tell you this verse. It's in Psalm eighty-nine, nineteen. It says, Then thou spakest in vision to thy saints, and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil, and I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. Uh, the enemy shall not exact from him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his adversaries before him and smite the on and on. Psalm 89 is all about that. But anyway, that's one of the ways God is going to cause these people to understand who is supposed to be their true shepherd. And their true shepherds are going to. Give them the clean water. Bring them out of their apostate bondages and bring them into freedom and peace. He said he'd make a covenant of peace with them. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, now I want to give you some homework, okay? Read Isaiah 49, and it will tell you about this awesome revival. Now, another thing I'd like you to do is start praying for this revival. First of all, you've got to have revival 
in your life in order to spread it to anybody else, right? Pray for this revival. Pray for it in your life. Pray for it in the people of God who have fallen away, who are backslidden, who are under the denominational, you know, backslidden religions, etc., etc. Pray, pray, saints, pray, pray. All the revivals of the past, some of them were very magnificent. Um, they all started with people praying, yeah, and believe in God. So pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much, Lord, for what you're about to do, Lord, and delivering your people and and uh, doing this wondrous work, delivering all of your people from their bondages and from their uncleannesses and uh, from the beasts that have devoured them and all these and the the false preachers who have taken advantage of them for their big ego sake. Lord, we just ask you in Jesus' name, Lord. Give us grace. Give us grace, Lord. Draw us towards that revival, Lord. Spring that revival up, Lord, and do a mighty work of of uh, saving your people in the name of Jesus. Oh, praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Father. My Lord Jesus. in you